ready. Let's do this. On today's episode of the CLS Experience, we have a very special treat. She's a former tech executive turned accidental super entrepreneur. <laughs> Her product was dubbed the unofficial drink of Silicon Valley, which can be found nationwide. She's a badass entrepreneur whose curiosity disrupted the beverage industry. She's a founder and CEO of Hintwater, a company dedicated to impacting millions of people worldwide to live a healthy lifestyle. She's a speaker, author of the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Undaunted, and an unbelievable mother to her four children. She's just an overall juggernaut in all facets of life and a phenomenal human being. Please welcome the iconic Kara Golden. How you doing, Kara? I'm good. Thank you for the nice intro. You wrote it, right? Uh, <laughs> somewhere along the way. Yeah, I did good by you because I take great pride in those. You, you did great. You did good. awesome. Awesome. And like I was telling you before, we could have talked for another couple hours before air, but we had to save some of the juicy stuff for the show, obviously. I know we both do a lot of this. This is going to be different. The audience is growing rapidly. They love a backstory. But to start it out, we're going to get a little weird. You ready to get weird, Kara? I'm, I'm ready. What is your superpower? My superpower? Uh, you know, I've been, I've been called fearless, but, but I think, yeah, I, I, I think, I think more and more than anything, it's, it's, uh, I don't even know if I would call it a superpower as much as I call it like a fault, right? That it's, <laughs> that it, it is a, right. And that there's a fine line when you think about superpowers, right? It's, sure. it's a, um, it's, I, I would have to say that, that I want to run before I can walk. I want to, you and I were talking about something, you know, just a few minutes ago oh, along the right. same lines, right? That it's just, you have to make sure that you're patient and you do it the right way. Yeah. Right. And so, and, and so while I'm fearless and I may look to be fearless, I'm very, um, I, I push myself to be more patient so that things get Same. done the right way. Yeah. I'm under construction as well in that category. I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. We want things when we want them. And when people like you and me, like we're willing to put in the work, sometimes you have to take a step back and just take a deep breath and understand there's a process to how all this stuff works. So I love that you touched upon that. Describe yourself in three words, Kara. Three words. Uh, I told know, you we were going to get weird. I know. I would have to go back to, uh, gosh, I would have to go back to fearless, uh, you know, cause I do think that there are some elements there. Um, thoughtful. I, I'm a, I'm a big thinker for sure. And I, th I think curiosity really leads a lot of my day to day. I'm, I'm constantly thinking about stuff all day long. And, Same. and I, I'm really, I, I thrive on curiosity. So I'm curious because it sounds like your mind is going hundred miles an hour. Like mine, do you have trouble sleeping at night? And if not, what's your secret? Like, how do you wind down? You know, it's, it's funny. And it's something that, that friends and family have always laughed at. I, um, I, I am a million miles a minute during the day. And at night I go to sleep. Really? No matter what. I'm like, it, yeah, it's just uh, my, my blood pressure is always like 110, even when I'm four months or when I'm four weeks overdue and in pregnancy and, and the world I'm, you know, 110 over 80. Like I'm, I'm constantly, that's what my blood pressure is. And, and I sleep just fine. And it is, uh, it, I think more than anything, you know, but I think it really, when you talk about sort of the secrets and, and kind of how do you, how do you sleep? How do you, um, you know, kind of live your life in, in this way? I think more than anything, it, it's really knowing and believing that things work out for a reason and that you have to 
sometimes go through the process of uncomfortable stuff and yes. challenging stuff. And you have to believe that those things really do lead to something bigger and better. This is gripping. The audience needs to hear that because especially when you're an entrepreneur, right? And you're on that journey and the ups and the, like you could be flying a hundred miles an hour up there the very next day or at the very bottom. But you have to understand that this is all happening for a reason. And it's all going to help you be battle tested and shape us. And it's all part of the process. Totally. And it doesn't mean that I go through these challenges and then say, uh, oh, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be great. You of know, it's, not. I'm not that annoying person, right? <laughs> I, I realize that, you know, there's challenging days and there's hard days and there's bad days. But I think one of the things that I've realized is that if you look back on those challenging times, every one of those challenging things that I've been through in my life, I've thought maybe at the moment, I couldn't really figure out why they were placed in my life. But then I started to realize, oh, that's why they were there later on in life sometimes, but I they were learning experiences. And when you think about life that way, and especially when, you know, you're hitting rock bottom, you're failing, you're, you know, not sort of living up to your expectations. Of when you're you going through be, it, yep. You're going through it. You have to believe that, you know, and, and own it that I might not get it right now, but I have to go through this direction. And maybe, when you think about it too, maybe sometimes I feel like there's just a random person that you meet along the way that you, that you're going through some challenging time that you can't really figure out the situation, but you meet that one person. And this has happened to me multiple times where really? I'm like, what, wait, why were they in there? And then they'll, they'll show up, you know, 10 years later at, uh, at, you know, maybe they were at a supplier and then this real life situation showed up where they ended up at a retailer that I was trying. And they were like, I remember you, you like we had this whole, and sometimes I don't even remember them except that like when they remind me, oh, there was a situation. And then I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do remember you. And then I realized that there was, there was some reason that they were sort of in my orbit in some way. Absolutely. And, and this is so profound like for the audience listening. Like, I don't believe in a coincidence. Like everything happens for a reason. And I know it's tougher to, to realize that when you're going through it. Most of the time, it's when you look backwards. But so true, like people are in your life for a reason, a season and a reason. And then maybe down the road, like it starts to click. So I think that's so cool that you touch upon that. Yeah, I, I'm such a huge believer in that. And, and again, like, I mean, one of the things that, that uh, one of the reasons why I wrote my book was that it was my journal. So sometimes- This book for the audience that, that's watching that this book. on YouTube. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's, it's funny because so many people have asked me like, why did you write this book? And the book was my journal. And I started journaling about six years ago because sometimes- I would try, I, I would have these experiences where I would think back on them, but I wanted to really realize in the moment how I was thinking about things. So I started writing things out and sometimes they were hard to write about them because they were like things that I just wanted to forget about. The 2008, yep. 2009 financial crisis, I wanted to forget about it, especially being a fairly new entrepreneur. Understood. Uh, and, but you know, it's interesting when I look back on that period of time and I would go back and, and some of my notes of, about how I felt about things or, you know, if I could have done something different, what would I have done? I would prompt myself to, to start to write about those things. When the, when the pandemic hit, I actually reminded myself that I'm going to get through this, that there, this is another challenging time but I've been through a bunch of other challenging times so I can get through this. I just have to pay attention to some of the things that I've learned along the way, including that I couldn't stay complacent, that I had to continue moving forward. And I had to figure out how I would continue moving forward, how I would continue figuring out 
how to get product on the shelf when we were running into all kinds of supply chain issues. Like all of those kind of things were lessons that I learned from that challenging time, one, either 2008, 2009 or another one. Um, but 2008, 2009 also reminded me that I didn't have enough money in the bank during that time. And that's why it hurt so much. And so I had said, if I was to ever go through that process again, and that the way that it wouldn't hurt so much to you know, have this sort of dropped in my lap was to have a couple of years worth of money in the bank. And so when the pandemic rolled around, I started seeing we didn't quite have two years worth of capital in the bank. We had about a year and a half worth of capital in the bank. And I thought we need to raise money. This is during a time when everybody's like sheltering in place and, and, you know, we're wondering what's next and, and watching uh, Netflix and day drinking. Yeah. And so that was a time when I said to my team, we got to go raise money. You know, I had a few people on my team, my CFO saying, you know, how are we going to do that? Like nobody's taking meetings right now. And I'm like, we've got to figure out a way to do it. Become I mean, resourceful. Yep. Right. And, and I think that that's it. I mean, the more of these challenging times, it's like you, you become a warrior, right? You become somebody who's lived through the battles. You brush yourself off and then you, and then you just keep going. And frankly, you want to surround yourself with those kind of people too. I've, I've talked to many entrepreneurs who, you know, some of them even hide the fact that they've failed or, you know, they've, they've maybe they haven't even been an entrepreneur. Maybe they've been fired. And I, those are my favorite people if they can own it, right? If they can own that this challenge and they learn from their mistakes, their lessons along the way that they're continuing to learn. Those are the people that I think you can gain the most learnings from and you should, you know, work to try and know those people. Agreed. And also something that I've learned recently is the vulnerability is a superpower, right? Like being honest and transparent, like about past failures totally. and mistakes and then sharing them. It's so true with what you just said. Like a lot of the people like on social media that like they, they look so perfect, they've done all these things. They're not relatable to me. Uh -uh. You want to see people that have been through it, climb their way back up because it shows that they're battle tested, they're resourceful. And also, like you said, and I'm curious to hear your answer, like when the pandemic happened and you, you start to get strategic, I feel like with everything you've been through, you kind of get excited about like the challenge of the world's closed right now, we should raise some money. Like, how are we gonna go about this? Does that kind of excite you like that challenge? Well, I mean, it was scary. Sure. Um, and it was it was a time I had never been through a pandemic like most of us, you yeah. know, during during it was it was a frightening time. But I think for me, it was like I kept reminding myself that I could do it and that there had been through a lot of I had been through a lot of challenging times that, frankly, I hadn't been through before and I didn't know how I was going to get through it. But I did. And it's like I didn't know how long it was going to take. I had to pay you know, super close attention along the way because I didn't have the roadmap. I, I didn't know, I didn't have the picture for the puzzle on how it was all going to turn out, but I knew that I just had to keep moving forward <laughs> and not be stopped. And yep. I think that, you know, I look at really the, the key. Yeah, totally. And I look at the, the, at the entrepreneurs that were probably in companies that were the most challenged. They were the ones that just froze. They yes. just said, you know, we can't work, we can't do anything, let's lay everybody off, let's, you know, let's just, let's not try and raise money because this is not the right time, we'll just, you know, tighten our belt and see what happens, and, you know, that wasn't us at all, I mean, we yeah. instead were like, here's the plan, here's what we're doing, and, and by the way, I mean, I, I run a beverage company, I was out there, you know, doing, taking cases out of the back room of Target stores and putting them on the shelf. And it's not what I was normally doing as a CEO of a company, but I also wanted to make sure that my employees were safe and yeah. that it was, you know, during a time that was really scary, but I think it, it definitely, it, it's, if I have book two, there will be a whole story on, on that because my book was already turned in before the pandemic hit. You mean when book two arrives? Exactly, exactly. That it's really just about, it's the same lessons. 
they're just written a little bit differently. And Same I think script, more, different actors. Yeah, totally. And you have to pay attention to the most challenging times and figure out what do you, what can you learn from those? Yeah, hundred percent. This is gold. And like what I always tell my clients, like the aspiring entrepreneurs, is like the only way you fail is, is if you buy into fear. Like as long as like when you have a thought like, oh, that didn't work out, just keep moving. Like what else can you do? How can you move the chain? So as they say in football or push the envelope or just move the needle a little bit each day. The only thing that you cannot do is just freeze and stop because the world will pass you by. And it's so true. Like so many people in the pandemic froze and, you know, like, you know, what they're going through now is probably not so promising, but the people that kind of got to work and took action, like you and me, like now you're not only reaping the rewards, but it, it also like you learned a lot from it, so to speak. So for everyone listening, like always keep moving. There's always a strategy. There's always a choice. There's always a move that can be made. Absolutely. And yeah. I also, you know, want to say too, it doesn't mean that you can't slow down. Sure. Right. And I, I think, but it's just stopping is just not really the best option that I've seen. hundred percent. And the audience loves to jump around a little bit, but I want to ask you one last important one yeah. before we dive into the journey. What is your definition of success, Kara? I think success is it's really loving what you're doing every single day. And you, you know, you touched on sort of the, the, the energy and, and the spark that you get from having this new challenge. I think that when there is no reason why you can't, why everyone can't be doing something that they enjoy to make a living. Right. And I think that oh. that's an important reminder to everybody. It's, it's gone are the days where, you know, you can't, you can go and hang a shingle and go and make a living doing something that you really enjoy doing. And I think that most people are really, in order to be good at something, you have to enjoy it. Otherwise it shows. And I, I think that that is such a, an important reminder to people is like, figure that out. And that is success. That is terrific because that's essentially how I built my entire brand in the pandemic is yeah. basically like, I, and I say this humbly, like I was manufacturing a lot of wealth on Wall Street as a business owner, but I was miserable and I was unfulfilled. And when I started my CLS brand, personal development, the podcast, the speaking, the coaching, like, I love this stuff. Like, and people always ask me, like, do you really love it? And I, I'll say something like this. Like, if I had a billion dollars in the bank, which I don't yet, I would still be doing exactly what I'm doing right now, talking to Kara collaborating you're good with at it. thank you so much i love this stuff like I, i'm yeah. so passionate about it i believe it's my purpose i'm helping people and i love this stuff but what i always try to tell people is like if you love something so much and you're passionate about it you can monetize it right like it doesn't matter if you yeah. love stickers or whatever it is like you could figure out a hundred ways to talk about it make a blog whatever the case would be like you can monetize your passion you don't have to settle absolutely and i think that that is that's a re a reminder at all ages, right? Like I, I think that, you know, frankly, I watch people who work on Wall Street, maybe they get into the C-suite, right? They continue to move on. And those are shockingly to many people, the most unhappy people. It's not really about money. It's really about the, you know- I can confirm, people, I've been there. Right? <laughs> those people continue to grow because they were good at, kind of playing the game, but uh, so many of those people just don't really enjoy what they're doing every single day. And then they're trying to figure out, you know, how do they not be depressed, right? Not how do they, you know, try and figure out that next big thing. And so I think that the quicker you start to realize that you can monetize something that you really enjoy doing, the better. Yeah. Beautifully said. This is so profound. I I'm already obsessed with this episode. I know the audience is going to be too. We're going to jump around a little bit. I know this is a big stretch and a big gap, but how did we get from growing up in Scottsdale, Arizona, all the way to working at AOL? Tell us a little bit about that journey. To AOL. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I, I left Arizona uh, and, and went to New York. I worked in, in media at Time Magazine. And did then, you know what you wanted to do? Uh, I, well, I graduated in journalism and I thought that I wanted to write. Okay. Uh, it was funny. I was, I was just speaking to a college campus last week and I was saying, you know, I think when you're in 
in school, you pick a major because you think I'm that major is going to lead to a job, right? That I'm going to be doing. And you pick your major because you're pretty good at something, but you don't necessarily pick that major because you love it. Right. And I, I don't know if that speaks to you or anybody nice. else, but I think it, there are so many people who maybe you're, you're great at numbers. And so then you, you know, you, okay, I'm going to go be a business major or finance major or whatever. And then also, right. Yeah. Or, and then you're like, wait, what, what am I doing? <laughs> what did I sign up for? I mean, how many people have, have, you know, gotten there. And so for me, I was a journalism major and I did like to write, but I never really thought about it as a career. And, and so I was a minor in finance. I actually took finance classes because I had friends in some finance classes and I, the schedule kind of worked out, but I, I was never really good at numbers and I numbers kind of scared me. So actually that was probably one of the smartest things I did when I was in college was actually go challenge myself and go take classes that, you know, I, I really didn't know whether or not I was going to be able to be good at, but I thought I would couple the two of those major in journalism, minor in finance and go and work for fortune magazine, but they didn't want me. I, I showed up in New York and I tried to get a job there. They didn't want me. I got a job at time, which wasn't too bad. They're lost. And then I got plucked out of there to go to this late stage startup called CNN. And, uh, and it was a place where, you know, I learned a lot. Ted Turner was still kind of running around the office with, I, even growing up in Arizona, I had never seen anyone wear a suit and cowboy boots before until I saw Ted Turner. And I was like, huh, okay, I'm, I, I'm with it. You know, I, I I'm mentioned, <laughs> I'm, I'm mentioned that because I, I think it's really interesting even before I got to AOL because working for CNN was a place where it was kind of the first place where I believed in 24 hour news, 24 hour news for those of you who totally dating myself here, but it wasn't <laughs> an obvious thing. I mean, now it's just like, of course they're CNN, right? But it wasn't an obvious thing. And Ted believed, and there was like 50% of the time we would watch him and he'd lecture to the whole team and he'd be like, you know, there's going to be 24 hour news all over the world and people are going to be watching it. And then, you know, you'd walk out the door and you talk to your friends and they're like, why don't you get to work at ABC? Like ABC is much better, like much safer. They're doing it. And that's, what's going to happen. This guy's like crazy. And part of you thought maybe he is a little crazy, but then he'd get these little wins going. And then you'd be like, Oh, okay. I mean, maybe he's going to pull it off. I don't, I don't know. And then you'd go home for the day and then you start again the next day. And it was this constant yo-yo that was going on. And I wouldn't have called it a startup. I mean, he didn't call it a startup back then, but I think it was that taste of saying it might happen. It might not happen that allowed me to kind of get the bug of wanting mm -hmm. to be with the underdogs, right? Working directly or indirectly for something that was something I believed in. And, and people would say to me, how did you know that it was going to make it? You didn't. Right. But you had a feeling like there's a chance it's a bet that I'm making and I'm betting on that person, the leader, but I'm also betting on the concept. So when I left CNN to move to San Francisco, I met my husband, my then fiance, and we decided to go out to San Francisco. We didn't know anybody. And he was graduating from law school, wanted to get into law. Get, get into technology law. That's when I thought, what is the company that I would want to work for or the individual I'd want to work for in San Francisco? The only company that kept ringing in my head was Apple. Steve Jobs for me was the guy. Like he made start. the cutest little computer. I had a computer <laughs> when I was in college. It was cute. Like everybody else had these big, stupid IBM computer. <laughs> and I had the cutest little computer that I saved my waitressing. Was it in. a Macintosh? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> With the little Apple on it. it was yes. the, you know, it was 
iMac. Oh, anyway, it was, it was amazing. So that's when I couldn't figure out how to get a job at Apple. I don't think I actually tried very hard. I, asked, I also figured out that it was in Cupertino, which was like a good hour from San Francisco where I was living. And I'm like, ah, that didn't sound that great. But instead, when I was doing my research, I found this little company that had spun out of Apple that was, it was five guys in an office and they worked for Steve and they were doing the CD-ROM shopping thing. And I thought maybe Steve will just be in the office, like having a cup of coffee or something. And that'd just be so cool to like meet somebody like that, that would be disruptive, that would know how to make a computer that was smaller than the rest and just cool like on a lot, much more graphically interesting, but that never happened. And instead, when I showed up to meet with, you know, these, these guys, they're all wearing jeans and t-shirt and no one was doing that in New York. Right. Like, and, and I thought, here's these, here's this environment. It was probably the first place that the second place I learned about entrepreneurs putting stakes in the ground where you thought it could make it, it couldn't make it, but it seems like it'd be a lot of fun. But I also learned about culture and I didn't know, I wouldn't have called it culture back then, but I just thought versus New York where everyone's wearing suits and women are all wearing heels and these guys are all in jeans and t-shirt and they have like PhDs and masters and, and, and like way beyond what I was doing. I thought, they actually are asking me if like, number one, they were excited that I worked for CNN, which was another startup on the other coast that they were like watching and they thought it was cool. But they also asked me something that was really, really important that I had never been asked before. They said, do you think you could contribute to our startup? So there's five guys who are all really, really smart and creative and they want to know if I can add value. And I think that that is such a key question. And I still ask that question when I'm hiring people today, because when you think about it, like they're inviting me into their circle, right? They want to know, do, I mean, maybe you can, maybe you can't contribute, but I was like, yeah, I think I could. I mean, there was 10% of me that wasn't sure if I could contribute, sure. but I'm like, what the hell? Like they, they actually asked and they weren't, they didn't care what school I went to, or if I had a PhD, they just, they were looking at what I had worked on, what brand I had worked on in New York. And they were like, she seems kind of cool. Like culturally, yeah. I think she'd be great to bring in. And so I took the job. I figured eventually like they'd fire me and I don't know. And then maybe I'll go figure something else out. I wasn't that concerned about it. And instead I contributed and I was signing up retailers to be on this disc. And then America Online, who was one of our investors uh, acquired us and asked me to run this button called shopping. And the ironic thing about that is that I was, uh, I you know, of course said, sure, I, I would love to do that. I didn't even have revenue targets. Nobody, this is 1996. Nobody thought that shopping or e-commerce was going to happen. And so it, like the guys that did sports and news and they all had revenue tar targets. They're like, oh no, it's going to be a while. Just like hang out, have conversations, whatever. And meanwhile, I'm like, we got to figure out how to grow the revenue every single year. That's what I was used to doing at CNN. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a crazy, crazy time. Hell of a ride, yeah. It, yeah, it was crazy. Awesome. And then another, you know, entrepreneur, Steve, Steve Case. And so, you know, watching him and, you know, Steve would probably not enjoy being reminded about this, but he wasn't, number one at that point we were acquired by america online and i mean he was they were like number three to these brands that no longer exist CompuServe and prodigy and so again friends of mine were like 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 i mean 
you guys got acquired by like number three. Like, how does that feel? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems good. Like maybe we can, and eventually we made it number one. And so that's the story of, and, and really the journey of going, of watching multiple visionary entrepreneurs. This is so cool. Right? Yeah. It's so you valuable know. to the audience, yeah. And I love that you caught the bug in New York at CNN. Like you didn't know, you went to school to be a journalist, like who knew, but like you saw the craziness of entrepreneurs and let me be crystal clear to the audience. We are crazy in the best way possible, but like you caught that bug. And then like, are you a big, are you advocate of the law of attraction or the secret? Yeah. I, I, a thousand percent. Because when you were telling your story, I couldn't help but think like you wanted to work for Apple. That was like your target. Steve Jobs was like the guy for you. So you went to this company and like, and you like not forced your way in, but like law of attraction, right? Like you went that route and then it, can you contribute to the company? Then you get bought up by AOL. You're in Silicon Valley, all that stuff. And like right next door to Apple, all that stuff. Like you have to be very intentional and on fire with the direction your life wants to take. And it's not a surprise as to where you are now and obviously everything you've accomplished. And I know you're just getting started, but you were infatuated early on from, from this kind of journey. It's great. Yeah. And it, it it's funny because I, I think I was never a person to really define it like that. Like I didn't sit there and say, um, I'm going for my goal. And sometimes I think that if you do that, you, you almost block yourself because you think, oh, I'm not reaching my goal. Right. How many people have said like, oh, I have this goal of whatever, like, you know, meeting Steve Jobs or making a million dollars or whatever it is. And then they don't get there. And they're so obsessed with getting there that they don't actually pay attention to what's happening along the way that's really supposed to be what's happening. And so I think for me, I've just always really led a life of enjoying who I'm around and being grateful yeah. and also um, just enjoying the ride. And I think every single day I, I set out doing something and it doesn't exactly turn out the way that I thought it was going to turn out, but it usually turns out better when you enjoy the ride and just go with it. I think uh, that's the most important thing. Amen. Like, I, I think you're incredible. I think you're so interesting. And I love that the audience is getting access to you inside your mindset with this whole journey. And I, I couldn't agree more. Like when you enjoy the process, like everything, it just feels better. Right. And, and just the whole journey and the whole ride. So I'm just, I love that. I'm obsessed with this episode there. I said it, you're on fire and, and oh, I love this. So from, from there, you end up leaving AOL at it correct me if I'm wrong, but I did my homework preparation breeds confidence. And also I'm a diehard fan. It stopped becoming as stimulating as it once was like how much money like, are you going to raise a billion, 10 billion? Like, it didn't excite you as it once did. And then you left there. And at this time you had three very young children. Is that accurate? Yeah. Well, I was, I was pregnant with my third at the time, but I think for me, maybe along the way, the elders were, were like telling me, you know, that a lot of the people that I worked with were like, really enjoy the time with your kids. Like, yeah. you know, and I kept being like, oh, yeah, 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 that's far off. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing my kids I'm traveling a lot and I'm seeing them change. And I kept thinking, you know, God, I don't really know my kids and I'm getting on United Airlines and the pilots all know me. Like, I'm just like, is this what I want to really be doing? You know, and it, and it was at that point when I just thought, maybe I need to just step off the train right now and, and actually sort of think about what I want to do. And I led with deciding to leave because I didn't want to travel as much. I wanted to just be around San Francisco. I had also chosen to live in San Francisco, a beautiful city, and I really just wasn't enjoying it. And I thought, I think I want to do that. And I didn't know anything more than that. I had, I decided I was going to take some time. And, you know, I think like the thing that was really challenging for me during that time too, was that a lot of people were saying, gosh, you've risen, you know, I was the youngest vice president at AOL. I was one of, um, I was, you know, one of the few women at sort of that level too. And people were like, isn't that really risky that you're like getting off now? I mean, doesn't that sort of like X you out of being able to kind of get back in on that level? And 
I was like, wait, five minutes ago, you were saying I was awesome. And I was very recruit, you want to recruit me for your company. And now I'm like, out, right? You've like, you know, marked me out. And, and I think for me, I just needed that time. I needed that time to kind of think about what I was going to do next and what I really cared about. And, yes. yep. and right. And reset in many, many ways. And so I did that. And it was during that time, I didn't have an people ask me all the time, did you know you were going to go start your own company? Did you always think that you were going to be a beverage executive? No. I mean, I like not even slightly and, and, but connecting the dots of how many entrepreneurs I had worked for that only laid the groundwork for me to, to say, I've got this idea. No one's doing it. And it's okay that I don't have the roadmap. It's okay that I'm creating an entirely new category that no one knows what I'm talking about. People are like so focused on the fact that I moved from tech to beverages. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I want to touch upon that for one second, yeah. what you just said, like for the audience, like, and, and we're going to get into it in a second, how she started hint, but she didn't just like create a new beverage. She manufactured a new category in this space. Like let that digest for a second. I think that's so cool. Yeah. And for those of you who have never really thought about what a category is in any industry. So when, let's say you have an idea and you want to keep it really quiet because like you're afraid someone's going to rip off your idea because no one else is doing it. I always tell entrepreneurs that ideas are a dime a dozen. It's at, it's the execution. Yes, It's 1000% the execution. I give it ideas away all day long. I, I just do Damn. it over and over again because I know that people won't do it. And then finally I get irritated and I'm like, I should just go launch this because this is just <laughs> like ridiculous because I know exactly how it should all play out. But it's, you know, the, the problem with creating a new category is when no one else is doing it, it's really hard and it takes longer. And you're, you're, you've now at least doubled your chances of failure because in our case, we were not only trying to get consumers to catch up to where I was, which was my idea for a, a product was an unsweetened flavored water. So water with fruit in it with no sweeteners. Sounds super easy. Why isn't this product on the market? Right. Everything had sugar or diet sweeteners in it. And so this is 16 years ago. Vitamin water was the hottest thing on the market. And it had so much sugar in it. And I was sitting there walking into my friend group and into grocery stores and everybody would say, wait, what's the difference between this and vitamin water? And I'd be like, a lot. I mean, there's a lot. no sugar, no sweeteners, there's no calories. And they'd say, oh, well, why isn't anyone else doing this? Well, I, I don't know, but I'm doing it. And so buyers would say to me, uh, we're going to wait. We're going to wait until you have competition because if there's only you, then it's probably not like consumers probably won't want it. That the market is speaking. They don't want it. And I'm like, what do you mean? I created it. I just got here. I just started. I just launched it. We're going to be huge. And they'd say, well, no one else is doing it. So you're probably not going to be that huge. And so the, it's like this catch 22. And, and again, this happens in every industry and when you're the only one it's it i guess the lesson is is that competition is not a bad thing your job is actually to be the best right but that doesn't mean that you're the only one the only yeah. one is hard and so one of the stories that i share in the book is you know i used to think and and early investors or potential investors that we would meet with would say if you are really successful Coke or Pepsi is going to crush you like a bug. They're going to come out with a competitor. You know, they have lots of money, like all the money that we would invest in you guys is going to be gone. All sounds logical, but the reality is, is when we started like getting a little bit of traction and we got into a major retailer, uh, one of the big soda companies came in and they knocked off our product. And that was a bad day when that happened. Like I thought, okay, we're done. Everybody says we're done. So we're going to be done. But the reality is, is that 
my goals where I, I was excited that I had a few, like a few b- skews of product inside this ma- major retailer. They came in the big soda company. They had two feet of space and their numbers that they did. I would have been excited about it. They weren't that excited. So then they stopped after six months. So we actually, when they stopped, we gained space. And so suddenly we were legit, which is counter. Like, think about this for a second. You're, it's counter to kind of what you think sure. will happen. The, sure. the big guy quits and he says, ah, I'm leaving. It's not important. But all of a sudden they helped bring credibility to this new category. And they also brought you customers that you didn't have before that still want the product. And so then they would, they, we went back into that space, we gained space, and then that actually helped us to get bigger. So, plot so twist. many stories plot like that. Yeah, yeah total yeah. plot twist. I, I love And this. not what I would have thought. And, and also, like you said, like there's always room for the best, right? A lot of people don't want to get started because they think it's a saturated market. There's always room for the best. Totally. And it's, and it really is a story, frankly, of there's only so much you can control. I can't control if a competitor like shows up tomorrow and, you know, people talk about, um, you know, looking at, looking at, you know, somebody else out there that is doing better and, and you can't do anything about that. Only the only thing you can do is look at yourself and continue to share with yourself that I have to keep moving forward and I have to keep, you know, upping my game. And yeah. that's the most important thing. How much business is Hidden Water doing today? So we're private. Uh, people have estimated at us uh, over a couple hundred million uh, no in sales. Deal. So we're the largest independent non-alcoholic beverage in the country that doesn't have a relationship with Coke, Pepsi, or Dr. Pepper Snapple. And, and rightfully so. Is the goal to go public eventually or no? TBD. Definitely a possibility. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's definitely look the the last 18 months have, have been um, crazy uh, on a lot of levels. We're a little bit different in, again, a dots eventually connect story. Uh, we started our direct to consumer business in 2012, which may seem like a duh for so many people, especially since I came from that world, but I was trying to follow the roadmap of the industry, right? Get into grocery stores, get into club, get into all of these different places and, and, and to show that we're better, right? But the, when we started doing direct to consumer initially on Amazon, and then we started on our own website, what we realized is that there were consumers that really wanted to buy Hint. Um, many consumers, when we started our direct to consumer, business were not going into grocery stores. Think about what's happened in the last, you know, almost 10 years where you've got, you know, DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub and all of these. And then in addition, all the tech firms, which we were huge in, were putting, you know, drinks in micro kitchens. So a lot of people stopped going to grocery stores or wouldn't go as, as often. And so they wanted to order their products like Hint to have in their fridge on subscription. And so that business over the last 18 months has tripled for us, tripled. And the, and the other thing that we've learned, which is counter to what people think, they think that if people buy online, then they won't buy in stores. And the, the reality is, is that people might go to stores less, like you might go to Costco less, but when you go to Costco, you go big right? Yeah. You want to buy, even if you are a subscriber to Hint online, you'll go into Costco. And if we have a cool pack or different flavors, you'll pick up, you'll throw it in your cart, yeah. right? Yeah. And so what we realized is that as our business, as our online business grew, we started getting phone calls from Costco and lots of other uh, partners out there too. And that business continued to grow too. Cause even if people weren't buying online, they saw the brand, they saw the, the, you know, the cookies following them 
on, online and then they went and they would go buy it in in, in those stores so and that, Cara, that a similar story to that is and also i, I want to mention real quick you guys, him water is the drink of Silicon Valley in Google, Facebook, all that stuff, which is so cool. But you talk about like following the cookie trail, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a story where you guys were in Starbucks and then that ended, it was not a great day, but that led to an email from one Amazon. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Yeah. And so, you know, another story of, of kind of learning from, you know, the challenging times, bad day when, Starbucks announced to us we were killing it at Starbucks and uh, we were surpassing our goals. And then they decided to change strategies and remove us from the case, the cold case at 6,000 Starbucks. That was a bad day. I had product already run that was sitting in a warehouse that I had to go back and tell my investors that we were not going to actually be selling to Starbucks. And that's when the good thing happened a couple of weeks later, this Amazon buyer reached out and said, Hey, I'm starting this business on Amazon and it's a grocery business. And uh, I was just wondering how fast I can get a couple of truckloads of hint. And of course I had it. And so I reached back out to him and he said, Oh, I buy your product every morning with my latte at, at Starbucks. And I thought, do I actually mention to him that we just got kicked out? He didn't ask. So I wasn't going to tell him and, and, you know, and, but we had the product. And so again, things happen for a reason, yes. right? The, but it also, there's so many lessons that I learned in, in that story and that I share in, in my book about that. But the other thing that I really learned from that bad experience from Starbucks is that the reason why it hurt so bad was that 40% of our overall business was sitting with Starbucks, right? So when Starbucks said, sorry, we're not doing business with you anymore, I had to you know, really, really hustle to try and figure out how I was going to handle the product that we had in the warehouse. I had to go back to investors, whatever. How could I have not been in that position? And how could our company have not been in that position? Have options, right? And that's the story everywhere, right? How many times like, do you walk into a situation and you're blindsided by something because you don't have options? If you don't have options, and that's what I share with entrepreneurs all the time, like even in the best times, sit there and look at your situation and you're thinking, okay, it's really good right now, but how could it be really bad? Like what, like just for kicks Respect. for a few minutes, think about how could it be bad? Would you actually be able to, are you diversified enough that it won't actually, it might hurt, but will it kill your business? It almost killed our business to have 40% of our business sitting in the hands of Starbucks to say like, sorry, we're not ordering anymore. Yeah. And I will never be in that position again. And so when you can learn from your tough lessons, know that there's going to be good coming around the corner in our case with Amazon. But the other lesson that was learned there was that we not only got another revenue channel through dealing with Amazon, um, and we figured out a way to sort of get out of that sticky situation, but when Amazon wasn't giving us, we were immediately successful on Amazon. People were buying our product on Amazon. Of course and, they were. and what was interesting, and I really hadn't woken up and sort of realized it until we started dealing with Amazon was that I wanted the emails from the consumers with Amazon that they were sharing with me that the people who were buying on Amazon were also buying things like diabetes monitors and sort of healthier things that led them to believe that there was this health halo over them. And I said, that's awesome. Can you give me a couple of emails? And the buyer laughed. He's like, Jeff Bezos isn't going to give you eight emails. <laughs> Forget it. And, and it was at that moment when I thought, wow, like, None of the retailers that we deal with give us the emails. And coming from tech and being able to have that direct relationship with the consumer, I never really realized that I was missing that. And so that was my purpose after that 
conversation with Amazon, I thought, I'm not going to compete against Amazon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create another channel where consumers can actually buy our product. I'm only going to do that. I want to have that relationship with the consumer, but I'm only going to do that if I have a reason for the consumer to shop from us. And they may just still decide to go to Costco or Target or Whole Foods or Amazon. But if I put all 26 flavors on our website, and everything else that we do on our website, we might not be the cheapest. We might, you know, you can still go buy and we, maybe we're not in the beginning, we weren't even offering like free shipping or any of those things. We're just like, it's availability. That's a reason for some consumers. They're like, yeah, it's a little more expensive, but I really want the cherry or I really want whatever. There are consumers out there. And so by having an understanding of why you're doing something at every point along the way, that was my purpose for doing that. And again, there was no roadmap, no one in the beverage industry, very few people in the food industry were doing what I was doing. But again, sometimes actually thinking about how do you satisfy the consumer, but also it's okay to have multiple channels and to not have all my eggs in one basket right. from the Starbucks situation. Yeah. Um, so it all came back kind of full circle for me. It's one of the many things I love about you. And I know we're getting close to the end here, but I wanted to just touch upon this because all the things that you did, like you did with a level of curiosity, it wasn't just business oriented. Like I know even when you started the sunscreen line, like I thought that was so cool because you had a basil cell, right? Yeah. On my nose. Yeah. And that was, uh, yeah, I, I started looking at why I don't wear sunscreen and I wore sunscreen on, you know, my chest and on my arms and legs, but only at the beach and never on my face. And that's why you don't I, want to mess up the foundation. Didn't want to mess it up, but also I didn't like the thickness. I didn't like the white, like the better ones were sort of, you know, white and sticky. And I just thought, I don't want that stuff. And that's when I thought, can I actually create a sunscreen that is better I think that the other thing that I was seeing too was that the, the better sunscreens that weren't thick and sticky were like 70 bucks a bottle. And I thought, even if you can, even if you can afford that, like it's kind of criminal that we <laughs> allow, right? The, yeah. These better products to be that expensive, especially as it relates to health. I yeah. thought it's yeah. really sad. I mean, people talk about, you know, better food products or, or drink products, like the healthier they are, the more expensive and out of reach they are for people. And, you know, I always argue not necessarily, I mean, Hint is very affordable. Hint is not, I don't want to create a product that prices people out of the market who want to get healthy. And I think that that is that there are definitely companies out there. I mean, margins for sunscreen and personal care products that are better for you are you know sometimes unaffordable but i mean for for me i wanted to also develop see for myself my curiosity yes. could i actually develop one where you could actually scale it and make a little bit of money on it but also you know do right for the consumer and that's always been my purpose and mission for this company yeah. The only negative that I have going on today is that we're wrapping up now and we don't have 10 hours to speak. This has been a oh, awesome conversation. The audience is going to fall in love with you in two seconds. Where can they hang out with you? Where can they support you? Where do you hang out the most? And also, is your book Undaunted on the Audible app? It is. Is it, it is. your voice? It's my voice. Woo! Yeah. So, That's great. Yeah. That's the next book. It's, uh, it, yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's, I always get a kick out of have people on the show that recorded and they always like, I always get a kick out of hearing their process, recording and hearing their own voice. How was that for you? You know what? It was, it was great. I mean, look, it, it was, I had to, the pandemic was just starting and, oh, and not. so I was, I mean, all studios were closed down and I mean, nobody was recording and, it, and, you know, it's so funny. It, it, as, as my husband said to me, leave it to the entrepreneur. I'm like, you know, I live in Marin County. My kids had gone, you know, to school with uh, the, 
one of the people in Metallica and the Grateful Dead and uh, Santana is around, you know, and I thought there are studios around here. I'll figure it out. I, I just have to network a little bit and figure out where they are. And so sure enough, I did. I mean, within like a few phone calls and I had it figured out. And, uh, and so, you know, I look, it, it's sort of the, the motto of my life. Nothing is ever unattainable, <laughs> right? Like you just, you just have to work a little bit harder to kind of figure stuff out along the way. And there's so many people that allow these walls to just block them from actually doing it. And, you know, again, I think there's a lot of people even that launched a book during the pandemic that said, oh, it's going to be a failure. I can't do an audio version of the book. I can't do this. And instead I just said, eh, there's a lot of people out there that are going to, I have lost less competition for finding a studio right now because everybody thinks you can't. And if you live a life thinking you can't do st stuff versus well, you living that you can, yeah, like, you know, you choose. And Which one are you going to be? I was just talking about this in my membership today, Replace Doubt with Unwavering Faith. And oh, by the way, we might have a, a name of the episode right now. Nothing is unattainable. That's yeah. priceless. Where can we, ha where can I hang out with you? The audience is going to be obsessed with you. I'm telling you right now. Also, I'm going to tag you on some stuff on Instagram. You have two accounts, right? You have yours and Hint. Yeah. And and it's Kara Golden with an I. And I'm all over social media and Twitter, on LinkedIn, Instagram, a uh, little bit on Facebook. Um, I'm actually, uh, I, I'm on TikTok as well. I have a whole thing on TikTok. It was a challenge against my uh, son. I said, I'll never dance on there, but I'm going to build a decent platform on TikTok. And so it's- uh, Because nothing is unattainable. Nothing's unattainable. And you just have to go spend some time there and figure some stuff out. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually a lot of my entrepreneur content and about, you know, really it's a younger audience and many, a lot of high school, a lot of college um, that are, that, you know, want to be entrepreneurs. And, and I think I just saw they just overtook YouTube as maybe the second most watched platform on the planet. It's great. I tell people I'm like, you know, I get on the front on the for you page, like constantly, because I'm just telling people like, you know, it's, it's like, get ready to fail. Right. And which is fine. It's okay to fail. Like, is your life supposed to be about perfect, you know, journey all that, like you got to fail along the way. Things aren't always going to turn out right. And that's okay. I just know that, you know, you're walking into something and you got to manage your risks and all those kind of messages I think are really important in a time when, you know, people might want to be entrepreneurs and they're going to school and there's all kinds of entrepreneurial classes and everything's going to be great. But when the rubber hits the road, they need to be told, you know, like the most important thing is to go try and trust yourself and know that you are smart and surround yourself with support and great people and, you know, lead with gratitude and kindness and have mentors along the way and, you know, get up and brush yourself off. All those kind of things are really critically important for people to hear. So, so that's where we drop the mic because it doesn't get more valuable than that to land a plane with that. Go out and take a shot. The only way you fail is if you don't take the shot. Guys, we're one of the most fastest growing rapidly podcast on the planet right now. All we ask, if you love the conversation, take a screenshot, share it, tag Kara, tag myself in it. And obviously go follow Kara on social media. She doesn't bite, right? No, I don't bite. Okay. Awesome. This has been so much fun. I just want to say to you, you're the definition of resilience, grit, and curiosity from your early days of being independent, figuring things out on your own, blowing up in the tech industry to disrupting the entire beverage industry. You not only created a category and product, but a global conglomerate brand that's helping millions of people worldwide lead a healthier lifestyle. You're an unbelievable mother to your children, a beacon of hope for anyone coming up today with big goals and aspirations, Kara. I'm so excited to continue to watch you spread your wings. I can't wait to listen to the audio book and I can personally guarantee your best is yet to come. You have my word right here, right now. This will absolutely not be the last time that you and I collaborate. Keep on spreading those wings, Kara. 
Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for listening and stop by and say hi to me too. Yeah. This was awesome. Have an unbelievable day. Thank you. You too. Too much fun. I meant it when I said, I wish we had 10 hours. Yeah.